Managing a photography business can be overwhelming. Between booking, marketing, scheduling, editing, culling, sharing, reviewing, tweaking, selling, invoicing, shipping, billing, that's a lot of inks. Zenfolio is here to help. Our suite of tools makes it easy to handle all the ings needed to run your business. So you can focus on the most important thing, capturing the moment. Go to Zenfolio.com to start your free trial today. Zenfolio. Hi, hello, welcome one and all. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv, the woman who absolutely physically cannot be brief when it comes to Greek plays. They're just too good, you guys. They're too good. And thus, we have three episode long arcs covering them because fuck, I love Greek tragedy so much. Anyway, anyway. I am here today with the final episode in the Prometheus Bound arc of episodes, the play that can be summed up pretty succinctly as a story of Zeus's tyranny, a fact that is in itself utterly fucking fascinating. Well, gods know I won't be able to finish this series up with any new kind of brevity, so let's skip any kind of real introductory rambling and jump right into the where were we of it all. So where were we? Prometheus is, obviously, bound. He's been bound to the side of a mountain by unbreakable chains, bound there physically by Hephaestus, but entirely on the order of Zeus, carried out by those personification gods Kratos and Bia. Bia, as you might have noticed, didn't speak. That's because of the three-actor rule that exists for most Greek tragedy. I've mentioned it in passing, but it's another fascinating bit about the history of these plays and how they are meant to be performed. Traditionally, Greek tragedies only ever have three speaking parts on stage at any given time, and then the chorus. The three actors then go on to play all of the characters in the play, swapping out depending upon who's there to speak. This play is unique, of course, in that Prometheus is on stage the entire time, chained to a mountaintop, so that actor wouldn't have had a chance to play any other roles. But Kratos, for instance, would have played maybe like Io or Oceanus or something with a different costume and different mask. Often that led to a more powerful play because while there would be an effort to make the actor look different, namely the fact that they all wore masks throughout the performance, but of course the audience would still know it was the same actor. Of course, now that I'm trying to think of a great example of this, it's not coming to me. But it basically just provides a different level of sort of depth because these characters who might be super interconnected in different ways, like sort of subtly in the story, also then are played by the same actor and just is like just an extra level. Also, it's just interesting. But here I am rambling again because Greek tragedy is fascinating. Did you also know that the masks that the actors wore might have also enhanced the volume of their voices? The shape of the masks may have been used to amplify the voices like early microphones. Fucking fascinating. Still, fine, I'm here to remind you all where we left off in the Prometheus Bound. Prometheus is bound. The chorus of Oceanids are there to make him feel better. Their father, Oceanus, stopped by to say hello and be the subject of Prometheus's woe is me, I'm the greatest savior of humanity speeches. Before Prometheus sent him off so he might continue to be the world's most important martyr. Then Io appeared in the form of a cow, at least in part, chased by a gadfly and haunted by the memory of Hera's guardian, Argos. This is episode 146, Io the Wanderer and Hermes the Bootlick of the Gods. Io 
has told her story, that she was sought out by Zeus, but essentially spurned his advances in the form of, well, just not going to the place where she was told he would find her and have sex with her. She sought to avoid this fate and so was transformed into a cow for it, forever to be followed and bitten by the horrible gadfly. For a time, she was guarded, watched, really, by Argus, the many-eyed guardian of Hera, whose eyes, upon his death, were put into the feathers of a peacock. Like I mentioned last week, Io's story in the Prometheus Bound is interestingly different from the more traditional version. Traditionally, she's with Zeus. Whether it's consensual is not always clear, but they are together for a time and Hera finds out. Zeus transforms Io into the cow in order to sneak her past Hera, who isn't as stupid as Zeus seems to think, and thus sends Argus to guard the cow that is Io. The difference is interesting because this is much more about blaming Zeus. Io's role in the Prometheus Bound is to be another victim of the wrath of Zeus, this tyranny that he has so recently inflicted upon the world. She's an example of how he has chosen to rule, with an iron fist, hell-bent on ruining the lives of anyone he thinks might have done him wrong in even the most minor of ways. I prefer this take on Io, obviously, as it absolves Hera of a lot of the violence. Not all of it, but it's not all about her punishing Io. It's just about Zeus's desire to be able to have sex with whoever he wants, whenever he wants, and what he'll do if that person attempts to avoid such a fate. Still, Io finishes telling the story to Prometheus and the chorus of Oceanids. She tells them about the gadfly that follows her, stinging her. She tells them about her wandering, and she's curious about just how much more wandering she will have to do. Spoilers, it's a lot. But the Oceanids hear this story and they're fearful of Io. It's not clear whether this is because they fear Zeus or just they have trouble with the story that she's told. It's a bit odd, honestly. But they respond to Io's story with horror and fear, and Prometheus has to talk them down. They've just explicitly asked her to tell her story, but once she does, they're horrified and they wish they'd never heard it. The chorus in this play seems to have a lot going on. They're not always particularly consistent in the role they're seemingly meant to play. Still, it gives Prometheus a reason to stand up for Io, to push the chorus and remind them this is literally what they asked for. And now, he adds, just as they requested in the first place, now that Io's story has been told by her, he can tell them all its sequel. Prometheus begins his speech, his story of Io's future, with, quote, Hear now the sequel, the sufferings this maid is fated to endure at Hera's hand. And may you, daughter of Inachus, lay to heart my words, so that you may learn the end of your wanderings. Prometheus goes on, he tells Io that when she leaves there, she should head east, towards the rising sun. Walk in that direction until you reach fields that have not been plowed. There live the nomadic Scythians, whose straw homes sit high above the ground on carts. Such an interesting note about a very real people. Love to hear how the Greeks saw other groups in their general region. It's fascinating. He continues, he talks about the weapons of the Scythians, bows and arrows. And remember, the Scythians are one of the main contenders for who the mythological Amazons might have been referring to. Don't approach the Scythians, though, he tells her. Continue on. You'll see another group of people, but they too should be avoided, as they're not a fan of strangers. Then you'll reach a river, but don't cross it. Follow it to the Caucasus Mountain, where rivers pour from its steep sides. And quick note, there's a footnote here that clarifies this isn't the mountain range of the Caucasus, but one mountain with that name. Take a southern pass, crisscrossing mountains, before you reach the Amazons themselves, quote, who loathe all men. I wish all the people who told me I hated men would at least refer to me as an Amazon when they did it. That would make the accusation much more enjoyable. Prometheus tells Io that these Amazons will gladly be her guide, which is nice, reinforces the loathes all men bid. They'll like Io and they'll help her because she isn't a dude. Prometheus continues, telling Io other location and river names that she will reach, many of which are the same journey as the Argonauts took when they sailed in search of the Golden Fleece, the idea being that she's traveling east and then south 
towards the very edge of what the Greeks saw as Europe. There is one body of water, the Maotic Straits, that will be difficult for her to cross. But Prometheus tells her she must steal herself and do it, but that after she does, the mortals of that region will tell stories of her legend, and it will be named for her, the Bosporus, the Cow Ford. Once you have crossed that, Prometheus tells Io, you will have left Europe entirely and will enter the continent of Asia. With this statement, Prometheus turns to the chorus, reminding them just how tyrannical Zeus is and how this story proves it. His note to the chorus, according to the Rom translation, is, quote, So now you see the tyrant of the gods is even-handed in cruelty. He set these wanderings because he, a god, lusted for her, a mortal. So again, we're emphasizing Zeus and not Hera, even if Hera's name was dropped at the beginning of the story of Io's wanderings and punishment. Prometheus finishes his speech by speaking once again to Io. Again, this is from the Rom translation, quote, How harsh a suitor came to seek your hand, dear girl, for all the words I've said so far are but a prologue to your tale of woe. When Prometheus finishes telling this story of Io's forthcoming wanderings, when he seems to finish the story with, basically, and that's just the beginning of the shit you're going to go through, Io is rightfully distraught. She interrupts Prometheus, crying out, I, I, I. To which Prometheus responds, quote, What, you are crying and groaning again? What will you do, I wonder, when you have learned the sufferings still in store for you? What a fucking asshole. Dude, read the room. My gods. Io laments even attempting to keep going with her wanderings. What is even the point, she asks. To which Prometheus counters, If you think your life is going to be tough, try being me. Honestly, Prometheus is getting more and more frustrating with every passing moment of this play. What's worse, do we think being chained to a mountain with a nice chorus of oceanids keeping you company, or being transformed into a cow and forced to wander all over multiple continents alone with a fucking gadfly stinging you all along the way? Io has it worse, Prometheus. Shut the fuck up. But does he? No, of course not. This is, after all, the Prometheus Bound. Prometheus decides that he has had it worse not because of the actual suffering, I think even he would have to admit that Io's experience is the worse one, but because of the length of punishment faced by both of them. Io's will end, even if it will be a long, long time from then. His, however, has no end in sight, not until Zeus falls from his throne. What's that? Io asks, flitting cow ears perking up. Zeus falling from his throne? What do you know about that? Tell me everything. Io is incredibly keen to hear that the king of the gods could possibly be brought low, that his tyrannical rule could come to an end. She wants to hear every tiny detail that Prometheus has to share. What follows, which I'm going to quote, is a great use of stichomythia, that is, the bits in a Greek play where there's a back-and-forth exchange by two characters, each having just a short line in response to the other. It's also a great word, stichomythia. Io asks, by whom shall he be despoiled of the scepter of his sovereignty? And Prometheus responds, by himself and his own empty-headed purposes. In what way? Oh, tell me, if there be no harm in telling. He shall make a marriage that shall one day cause him distress. With a divinity or with a mortal, if it may be told, speak out. Why ask with whom? I may not speak of this. Is it by his consort that he shall be dethroned? Yes, since she shall bear a son mightier than his father. So much being said here, and yet so little. The two go on, with Prometheus saying that the only way for Zeus to avoid being dethroned is to release Prometheus, but that it isn't destined to happen for many, many, many more generations. Who's going to release you? Io asks him. A grandson of yours, 
Prometheus tells her. Who could it be? So there's a lot of interesting things going on in this exchange. First, we hear talk of Zeus being completely dethroned by a divine son of his who will be more powerful than even Zeus himself. This may sound vaguely familiar, but of course, it's not something that ever comes to pass. The idea being that Prometheus will be released and thus Zeus's downfall will not take place. It's a bit unclear how these two things are related, but the stories that come along with both pieces are things you all know well, and that the ancient audience watching the play would have also been very, very familiar with and invested in. That's what's so interesting about so many Greek plays. The idea that the audience watching would know all the bits and pieces. They would know all the history of these characters, the background, and what's going to happen to them after the play. That is, this son that would be destined to be far greater than Zeus and dethrone him entirely would be the son of Zeus and Thetis. Of course, in the end, Zeus becomes aware of this and he prevents Thetis from ever giving birth to a fully divine child at all, let alone one by him. Instead, Thetis' son is with the mortal hero Peleus and is none other than everyone's favorite lover of Patroclus, Achilles. Achilles, were he the son of Zeus and Thetis, or maybe even just Thetis and another powerful god, would surely have taken down Olympus entirely. As it stands, he did some pretty severe damage to Troy. And the offspring of Ios that will eventually free Prometheus? Heracles. But, as Prometheus goes on to explain to Io after this back-and-forth exchange, that won't be for a long, long, long time. Io asks when this will happen and which of her descendants will it be. She is, rightly, interested in news this important. But Prometheus, though he's trying to tell her the truth, is being cagey. It isn't good news, the answer to this question. Io is so many generations removed from Heracles when it comes to the mythological origins that they might as well not be related at all. This, though, isn't something she'd want to hear, as it just means that she's left to wander for gods know how many more years. That, though, is Io's fate, and at the very least, it's what she'll go on to become very, very famous for. Io wants to know more, though, and she continues pressing Prometheus. He eventually tells her that he will answer one of her questions about her future, but only one. Either I will tell you what's to come in your tale of woe, or I'll tell you who will go on to free me. You have to pick one, Prometheus states to Io. But the chorus interrupts here. The Oceanids want to hear both stories. They nudge Prometheus, telling him, just, well, tell Io one of the stories and then tell us the other one. That's more than fair, they say. You tell Io what fate lies in store for her, and then you tell us who will eventually free you. Of course, this is really just a way to allow Io and the audience to hear both stories. Whether it was the Oceanid's intention to help Io or not isn't entirely clear, but I'd like to think they're being kind to her. Or straight up, they just really want to hear more stories because they seem a bit over the top generally. I mean, either way, Io gets to hear both her fate and the fate of her descendants, so great day for Io, all things considered. And so, with that, Prometheus begins the first story about the fate of Io from there on out. He tells her where she should travel once she leaves Prometheus and the Oceanids, giving her explicit instructions on where she should go and what she will see. Frankly, we're not concerned with too much about that beyond where she will end up. But he does explain to her that along the way she will pass through the Plain of Gorgons, which I mean cool, so we're going to dwell there for a moment. Prometheus explains to Io that she will pass through the plain of Gorgons, and that there, there are many daughters of Phorcus. Firstly, the Grey Eye. I've spoken to you all about the Grey Eye so many times, so I won't harp on them. They're the three old crones who share one eye and one tooth between them. A less than ideal existence, if you ask me. But what I appreciate about Aeschylus' description of them is that he notes that they look like swans, and that they have the body of swans. 
I did a bit of digging into this because it's weird and thus interesting, but it seems to me that Aeschylus is the only surviving source we have fully describing the Grey Eye as swan-like, let alone literal swans. There are ancient sources discussing Aeschylus's interpretation, but it seems pretty unique and possibly just a way to describe their age. They were old, crones, white, like swans. It's odd, and I like it. The point, though, is that Io will pass by them. She will also near the three sisters that we know and love, the Gorgons, the other daughters of Forcus, my snaky-haired beloveds. He warns Io about these Gorgons, that they are loathed by humankind and that mortals may not look upon them and still draw breath. I love you, Medusa. But he doesn't dwell there. The Gorgons aren't the point. They're just another marker for Io on her long, long wander. Prometheus's description to Io about where she will go continue before he finally lands on her final destination, the Nile River Delta. There, Prometheus tells Io, you and your children will found a thriving settlement. Prometheus finishes this by saying, quote, If anything of this is confusing to you and hard to understand, may you question me yet again and gain a clear account, for I have more leisure than I crave. Hey, if any of this isn't clear, ask away. I've got all the time in the world. When Prometheus finishes the story telling Io that while she's destined to wander for a bit longer, she will eventually find herself at the Nile River Delta, where she will begin a dynasty of descendants. The chorus clarifies with him, asking if he's left anything out, but if not, that he should continue on with the rest of the story. Now, Io landing on the Nile River Delta makes it pretty obvious which dynastic culture she's intended to have founded. Egypt. Io is one of the ways that Greek mythology attempted to understand the Egyptian civilization, and through that, she becomes connected with the Egyptian goddess Isis. Of course, this is all about Greek mythology finding a way to connect themselves to the culture to the south that they knew was so, so advanced and skilled and impressive. They wanted in on the badassery that is the Egyptian world, and they did it by inventing a story where a very Greek woman travels the whole of the Mediterranean before finding herself in Egypt. This is, obviously, a not ideal way of seeing the Egyptian people, as descended from Greeks and very much based in the way the ancient Greeks truly wanted to believe that everything Greek was best. The Egyptians were, of course, much more ancient than the Greek world and very advanced. There are probably historians out there who could give way better context and maybe take issue with this way of seeing it, but I'm really just trying to emphasize the importance of Egypt and the region, and thus the reasoning for the Greeks wanting to make them Greek. Of course, there's a lot of crossover between these two groups of people with travel and trade and thus immigration and the like, so that isn't to say that there wasn't Greek blood in the Egyptian world quite early on anyway, and vice versa. I just want to emphasize the way this story was used. It's important and honestly just super fascinating to examine the ways in which Greek mythology was used to spread the idea that the Greeks originated so many things and so many people. See, the ancient Greeks watching this play would have known the story of Io, they would have known her mythological connections with Egypt, and that she would go on to spawn the Egyptian people. There's more to this dynasty that she's meant to found, but Prometheus will get there. He goes on. In case you worry that I've been bullshitting you this whole time, Io, I'll prove myself by telling you your own story up to this point. That is his next story, he says. He will remind Io what's happened to her. Is this a kindness? I think not. He's about to make her relive her trauma in order to prove himself to be, I don't know, helpful? It's a bit wild. Still, he does it. He tells Io that, for her sake, he won't rehash everything she's been through, just the most recent bits. How nice of him. He tells her about her own wandering, how she reached Dodona, where Zeus's own oracle tells prophecies via the shaking of oak trees. 
Yes, I've got to talk to you all about Dodona sometime. Prometheus tells her about when she reached Dodona, she was hailed as Zeus's wife to be. How nice for her. Oh, no, it wasn't? Is any of this pleasing to you? Prometheus asks as an aside. Then he continues. Still being stung by that awful gadfly, you continued on to reach the Adriatic. And he tells Io, because of your wanderings to that sea, the gulf will always be named for you, the Ionian. That most of the seas around Greece and the Mediterranean take their names from mythological figures thrills me to no end. The Ionian, the Aegean, the Icarian. Incredible. And that, Prometheus finishes, proves my skill in prophecy. Ah, Prometheus sure is proud of himself. But wait, he says, now I'll tell you the rest of my previous story about what will come after your wanderings. Prometheus sure does love to talk. So finally, 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 Prometheus sets out to tell Io about the future of her family and how that will eventually lead to his being freed from his bondage there on the side of a mountain. Freedom that won't come for many, many, many more generations. Prometheus tells Io and the chorus of Oceanids that in Io's wandering of the Nile, she will eventually come to a city called Canobus, which sits by the Nile. There, he tells her, you will be returned to your natural form. Io is a nymph, kind of, by relation, but the idea is that she will be transformed back into a human form by Zeus. He will touch her, Prometheus says quite specifically. The word touch is interesting here and important because while it clarifies that Zeus's touch is pretty magic and specifies his touch is harmless, in one translation, and unterrifying in another, it still serves to impregnate Io. Goody! So Io will give birth to a child called Epaphus, which the name actually relates to touch as well. Prometheus tells her this, and that Epaphus will be the child of Zeus. Prometheus also clarifies that Epaphus will be dark-skinned. Epaphus was, according to a footnote in the Rome translation that I'm reading, associated with the Egyptian god Apis. At least he was by the Greeks. In a troubling turn, though, the other translation we've referred to throughout most of this, which is much older, translates him to just being dark versus dark-skinned, which has bizarre and troubling ramifications. Two very different things, particularly in Greek myth. Epaphus, though, is dark-skinned. He is Egyptian, and he is the first in Io's line. This is obviously an important piece when it comes to debunking the long line of nonsensical whiteness placed upon ancient Greece, as if there were zero dark-skinned people in their orbit. Because not only is Epaphus, Io's son, dark-skinned, but he begins her dynasty of, at least for now, dark-skinned descendants. Epaphus, Prometheus explains, will have a great life on the Nile, appreciating all the fruits it has to offer. The Greeks sure understood just how incredible the Nile was when it came to surviving and thriving as humans on its banks. From Epaphus, Prometheus then jumps down the line a ways. He tells Io that Epaphus's great-great-grandchildren will be a family of 50 women. Sound familiar? There's only one story of families of 50, and I've told it to you before. Yes, quote, 50 maidens shall return to Argos, not of their free choice, but fleeing marriage with their cousin kin, while these, their hearts ablaze with passion, like falcons eagerly pursuing doves, shall come in pursuit of wedlock unlawful to pursue, but God shall grudge them enjoyment of their brides. These are the Danaids and their cousins, the sons of Egyptus. 
Both Danius, their father, and his brother, Egyptus, are relations of Io's. I mean, obviously both of them, they're brothers, but still, I'm trying to make sure I use the name Egyptus here. So Danius and his 50 daughters, the Danaids and Egyptus, whose name the Greeks associate with the name of Egypt, had 50 sons. The sons of Egyptus want to marry their cousins, and the Danaids are absolutely not interested. And so, as Prometheus said in the quote, the Danaids flee back to Argos, Io's home. Of course, 49 of them will go on to murder 49 of their cousins and cause a whole dark and bloody kerfuffle there. But there are two that aren't a part of the murder. The woman is Hypermnestra, and it's from her and her cousin, Lynceus, that Io's line keeps going. Finally, more generations down the line, they will be born my savior, Prometheus tells Io. Of course, he's referring to Heracles, as I mentioned earlier. I don't believe in spoilers for things like that in these plays, because I think such a huge part of what makes them so interesting is that the ancient Greeks would have known who everyone was talking about, even if they weren't named. Here, specifically, Heracles' name isn't given, but everyone would have known exactly who Prometheus was talking about. (sighs) Prometheus finishes telling Io of the fate of her descendants by saying that all of this was told to him in a prophecy by his mother, the titan goddess Thamus, and that these facts are all that matter. The how and the why things will end up as they do don't matter. In response, Io is stung once more by that goddamn gadfly, and she lets out a wailing cry. I, I, Io cries out before she says, quote, Once again convulsive pain and frenzy striking my brain, inflame me. I am stung by the gadfly's barb, unforged by fire. My heart knocks at my ribs in terror, my eyeballs roll wildly round and round. I am carried out of my course by a fierce blast of madness. I've lost all my mastery over my tongue, and a stream of turbid words beats recklessly against the billows of dark destruction. And that is Io's last lines in this play. With this, Io leaves the stage and the play entirely. She leaves to go on to become vitally important in the world of the Greeks. Her descendants will be people like Perseus, Heracles, and Cadmus— but she still has a lot of suffering in her future. With Io gone, the Oceanids, well, they basically gossip about her. I don't love the Oceanids in response to Io, though they're not surprising. They speak about unequal marriage and how troubling unequal marriages can be, essentially saying that Io's life is so awful and difficult because she had one of these unequal marriages with Zeus. Obviously, their idea of marriage isn't the same of ours, since they also add that much of her suffering is due to Hera, his actual wife. Io didn't choose to be with Zeus, and she certainly wasn't married to him. He spotted her and then ruined her life. And the Oceanids shit-talk that situation. Prometheus, thankfully, brings them back to the matter at hand. The reason of all of this, and the subject of the first half of the play... He's there to remind them about Zeus's tyranny. Prometheus speaks of the forthcoming fall of Zeus at the hands of the children of Thetis. He speaks of a curse uttered by Kronos as Zeus took him down. This play seems to be the only reference to such a curse. I find this also fascinating. Prometheus is so sure of Zeus's fall that he will be taken out by this child of Thetis. The chorus questions him, saying that this is only what he wants, that he can't be certain of it. But he is certain. Prometheus is 100% sure that this will happen, and that he needn't even be remotely afraid of Zeus, because he himself isn't fated to die, and Zeus is fated to be overthrown. It's fascinating, and suggests that Prometheus knows more than anyone, even maybe more than the fates themselves. 
Still, in the end, this doesn't happen, and the audience would know that. They know Achilles. So what does that say about Prometheus and his prophetizing? They continue on like this, Prometheus being entirely certain of himself, confident in his fate. Ash noted in their research that this also suggests that maybe Prometheus did what he did, stealing the fire, because he knew all of this would go down, he knew he'd be punished by Zeus, but that Zeus would end up falling, that then Prometheus would be freed by Heracles. It opens up a lot of questions about Prometheus's knowledge, like I was just saying, and his understanding of fate. But he's interrupted. Hermes arrives on stage and Prometheus greets him as the errand boy of Zeus. In the Rom translation, he says, quote, The errand boy of Zeus is coming, the lackey of the tyrant's new regime. I am utterly obsessed with this language of tyranny when it comes to Zeus. It's so pointed when it comes to Athenian history of tyranny and the introduction of their form of democracy in response to tyranny. Here, Zeus is a tyrant, just like human king tyrants. And I love it. Hermes is there for one thing. Zeus wants information on this fateful marriage that will result in the sun that will take him out completely. He's heard rumblings. He knows this idea that there is a son that will overthrow his father, overthrow Zeus, just like Zeus overthrew who overthrew Uranus. It sure is a pattern. Again, from the Rom translation, Prometheus's response to Hermes is just too good. Quote, a lofty speech and full of self-regard, how fitting for the bootlick of the gods. The bootlick of the gods! Ugh. <laughs> Prometheus and Hermes trade insults. Once again, I remind you of the brilliant word for this, back and forth type of exchange in Greek plays, stichomythia. They go back and forth, Prometheus refusing to tell Hermes the prophecy he's looking for. Hermes questions why Prometheus is bothered enough by Zeus's actions to allow himself to be punished in this way. They don't see it the same. Hermes sees the gods in power, and thus, what's the problem? He's happy being Zeus's messenger boy. Prometheus, meanwhile, is the martyr, but also, I mean, he's kind of right in terms of Zeus's actions. He's very confident in his decision. He's happy to be punished as he is if it means he gets to stand up to Zeus, the tyrant. And so Hermes takes this opportunity to straight up threaten Prometheus. Think about what you're doing here, he says. If you don't give us what we want, Zeus will rain down even further punishment. He threatens thunder and lightning that would smash the mountaintop where Prometheus is chained, that he would be entombed within it. And then he threatens the more famed punishment of Prometheus, that Zeus would send an eagle, the symbol of the god, to fly to Prometheus and tear him up, feasting on his liver. This wouldn't end, Prometheus adds in finishing his threats, unless some god was willing to take you down to Tartarus itself. Prometheus, unsurprisingly, is fine with all of these threats. He's not concerned with himself. He's stuck on this understanding that he has a fate and what's to come. Hermes warns off the chorus, saying they should leave Prometheus now lest they get caught up in the further punishment that's forthcoming. And though they briefly had agreed with Hermes that he might have had a point, they stay with Prometheus. And so, with that, Hermes leaves them alone, and as soon as he's gone, the roar and clap of thunder and lightning begins while Prometheus speaks his final, brief speech. Quote, Indeed, now it has passed from word to deed, the earth rocks, the echoing thunder peal from the depths rolls roaring past me, the fiery wreathed lightning flashes flare forth, and whirlwinds toss the swirling dust, the blasts of all the wind leap forth and set in hostile array their embattled strife, the sky is confounded with the deep, Behold, this stormy turmoil advances against me visibly, sent by Zeus to frighten me. O holy mother mine, O you firmament that revolves the common light of all, you see the wrongs I suffer. Then, 
that it ends with Prometheus yelling about his suffering is just so pointed towards the Zeus as a tyrant narrative and the Prometheus as a martyr narrative, but also the Prometheus as an important figure of Greek myth narrative. It is so many things in once. It is so beautiful. Oh my god, this play is so fascinating. Again, nerds, as always, thank you so much for listening. I really do love telling these plays, and I love when I hear from you all that you love them too. I love hearing that you all love any specific type of episodes. It really gives me a boost. It reminds me that I'm doing something that people really enjoy and find valuable. So please feel free to reach out anytime. My social media is welcome to you all. It's Myths Baby everywhere. Again, a huge thank you to Ash Strain, who helped with research on this play. They have been invaluable. Next week, I'm diving into something a bit more traditional. We're talking Apollo, an episode dedicated to the god of everything and also nothing, as far as I see it. I'll explain next week. After that, I'm going to revisit one of the most famous women from Greek myth, someone I've I've really only talked about in relation to the men around her and the way that that a war started because of her, Helen. We're diving into everything Helen, from the mythology to what she means as a person in storytelling and reality. I am psyched. And there's even more exciting things to come because, again, I've actually been planning ahead. What a concept. Stay tuned here and on my Twitter and Instagram where I'll be announcing things soon. Thank you all. As always, you're truly the best. We're getting closer and closer to the time of year when you get your Spotify wrapped notifications and you all share them with me and they thrill me to no end. Cannot wait. Feel free. And also, I guess, listen and follow on Spotify. (laughs) Thank you. I am Liv and I love this shit.